for just a few um, observations that I've made as I was sitting here listening to uh, Michelle and Doug. Uh, the first one is that I wasn't Michelle's top pick. <laughs> um, the second is that this table, some of you may have noticed, <laughs> and as it was, as it was uh, teetering, um, I started thinking, I wonder if this is a metaphor for my talk, and if I'm walking some kind of a tightrope, and I could easily fall from one side to the other. And the third observation that I made as I was sitting here is that they're sitting at one table together, and I'm sitting here. Uh. And as I was thinking about that, I was wondering, in, am I the odd man out? And I think the answer is yes, and I think you'll know why in just a minute. Um, so preparation for this talk compelled me to reflect on a number of things, not least of which is the title of this panel, Zionism in Academia. Zionism in Academia. Um, well, to comment on Zionism in academia, we first have to agree on what Zionism is. Now, the term Zionism, particularly when it's used in Israel, can mean many different things. Well, for ordinary Israelis, it seems to mean little more than patriotism and belief um, in a state for Jewish people. We should probably add to this the idea that all Jews around the world make up one people whether they like it or not. However, once we move beyond this kind of superficial representation, the concept of Zionism becomes far more complex. So in the early 20th century, Zionism was associated with socialism and received the support of trade unions, the kibbutz, left-wing intellectuals. In the early 21st century, Zionism is increasingly associated with religion, excluding, of course, anti-Zionist Orthodox Jews. Now, to many religious Zionists, Israel should be governed by halakha, Jewish law, implementation of which will pave the way for the arrival, not the return, of the Messiah. Now, right-wing Zionists would like Zionism to translate into the extension of Israel into all of historic Palestine, what they call the Reds Israel, with as few non-Jews as economically feasible. So if you think about it, what we have then is Zionism as social welfare, Zionism as prophecy, Zionism as geography and political economy. But it gets even more complicated than this. So Theodore Herzl, one of the founders of Israel, wanted a liberal, <coughs> secular state. Rabbi Meir Kahan, a former Israeli parliamentarian, wanted a fascist state. Albert Einstein wanted a humanist state. And settlers, well, settlers just want everything. <laughs> So Zionism is indeed quite complex. However, in practice, Zionism has been simplified through appropriation by the ultranationalists, by the religious fanatics, and by settlers, and with the opportunistic complicity of politicians and the media. We're back to the superficial representation of Zionism as support for a Jewish state. So when swimming, and I would probably say drowning, in superficiality, anything can be justified. So displacing Bedouins in the name of Zionism. Transforming a settler college into a university in the name of Zionism. Building settlements on Palestinian land in the name of Zionism. Hunting Africans who do not possess immigration permits in the name of Zionism. So theft, deprivation, dispossession, and predation. All of these can be carried out in the name of Zionism. Not unlike the Americans, their drone attacks kill children, 
Obama's assassination policy, all of which can be carried out in the name of national security. So sadly, we in here in Canada don't have an existential threat that we can point to. So instead, Harper's regressive policies can be chalked up to the economy and maybe investor confidence. Not nearly as sexy, but as the latest elections show, quite effective. So what I can say about Zionism in academia really depends heavily on what is meant by Zionism. But when it comes to academia, it's a little bit easier. So by academia, I suspect the organizers had in mind universities and maybe CGEPs or colleges. But for purposes of this talk, I'll include all institutions of learning. Now if we tie this together, the panel might be renamed socialist, religious, right-wing, liberal, secular, humanist, fascist, settler, mainstream, Zionism in institutions of learning. Bit of a mouthful. Now, are there representatives of these different groups interspersed across these institutions? Yeah, probably. But this doesn't actually say much. And it would be a mistake all with the same brush. It would be an equally, it would equally be a mistake to do as many in the Israeli government would have us do, and to reduce Zionism to a very simplistic, cookie-cutter version. There are many contradictions within the Zionist movement, and these should not be glossed over. Einstein, for instance, with his humanist views, would surely have taken issue with the incarceration of millions of Palestinians. Socialist Zionists are heavily troubled by the massive social inequalities that spurred the tent movement. Inequalities, I point out, which are tied to both the occupation and to the privileges afforded to settlers. Liberal, secular Zionists are surely worried about the rise of the ultra-religious movement and their impact, likely impact, their impact, their influence on religious freedom, or to the liberal and secular, secular freedom. And many mainstream Zionists, while believing that Jews should have a land of their own, are likely uncomfortable at the reality of open-air prisons and ethnic cleansing, both of which are needed to preserve a Jewish state. So these contradictions provide fertile ground for challenging many of the policies of the Israeli state, Challenges would, would, in fact, benefit from support from certain Zionists, although not from others. Of course, we shouldn't really be surprised by oversimplification. It is a key tool for most movements, whether Zionist or Palestinian, whether socialist or capitalist. Oversimplification is regarded as necessary to build broad-based support. And we shouldn't be surprised by the presence of Zionism or of Zionisms in academia. There are people of all political pensions everywhere. What is surprising, however, is the presence of oversimplification in institutions of learning, since the concept of learning is in fact antithetical to notions of oversimplification. Or at least it was. Now, at any rate, this panel is not particularly interested. Now, this panel is not about whether Zionism is present in academia, but whether Zionism is overrepresented in academia. And to this, I'm afraid I must disappoint and say no. I do not believe that Zionism is overrepresented in academia. What I do believe, what I've observed, is that oversimplification of Zionism is present within academia, and that it is this oversimplification which gives the illusion of overrepresentation of Zionism in academia. So if you ask a wide number of students and academics whether Jews should have a state of their own, I suspect the vast majority of them will say yes. <laughs> 
If you ask a wide number of students and academics whether Palestinians should be ethnically cleansed so that Jews can have a state of their own, I, I hope the majority <laughs> would say no. As Zionism is tactically reduced to support for a Jewish state, opposition to Zionism is understood as opposition to a Jewish state. Or, as many within the oversimplification movement would have it, opposition to Zionism equates with opposition to Israel, opposition to Jews, opposition to Judaism, and ultimately to anti-Semitism. Now, of course, in an over mindset, the layers are removed, and all that remains is opposition to Zionism equals anti-Semitism as I expect to be labeled after this talk. <laughs> Oversimplification then leads to the illusion of over-representation of Zionism and the illusion of over-support of support for Israel in academia. And this type of oversimplification leads to what I've observed in academia in relation to this topic, self-censorship. Now, self-censorship is damaging for Palestine, is damaging for Israel, and is damaging, ultimately, for institutions of learning. Self-censorship is the act of censoring oneself, usually out of fear, and without overt pressure being exerted. Now, the absence of overt pressure is what makes this most interesting. Hence the term self-censorship, and not just censorship. Well, Self-censorship is a natural consequence of oversimplification, <coughs> because an important byproduct of self-censorship is irrational fear. Academics will often claim to be afraid that our politics will impact our career. Do they? To some extent, I'm sure, but I'm not sure whether it's much more so than in any other domain. And in fact, to some extent, my experience has been, in fact, less. So most academics I've met, regardless of their political inclinations, tend to be heavily moved by reason, or at least their perception of reason. If there's anything an academic cannot stand, students should be aware of this, it's sloppy reasoning. Now, the politics are relevant, of course, and there's no denying that. It really would be a mistake to dismiss them. But the mistake is no greater than the one we make when we presume that lecture theaters are only open to people with very specific, narrow views. So it's fanaticism and oversimplification that are best avoided in academia, both of which are, in fact, quite common in relation to the Palestinian issue. Now, colleagues will often say that it is difficult to resolve this issue because it goes back centuries. It does not. Colleagues will often say it's difficult to resolve this issue because it pits one religion against another. It does not. Colleagues will often say it is difficult to resolve this issue because the solution is too complex. Most of what my colleagues say is not born of intimidation of the complexity of the issues. Complicating things is what we academics are paid for. But because they oversimplify the issue and thus will justify self-censorship. They think it's tactically safe to avoid saying anything even remotely critical of Israel because they too suffer from an irrational fear. I say they too because just as some Zionists willfully fall victim to the irrational fear of a big, bad Palestinian boogeyman waiting to push them in the sea, so too do certain academics willfully fall victim to the irrational fear of a big, bad Zionist boogeyman waiting to push their career into the sea. Now this is irrational, this is sloppy, 
This is indefensible, and especially has no place in an institution of learning. So I'll conclude with a question. Israel is built on a conception of Jewish citizenship. This means that non-Jews cannot become citizens of Israel. Being a Canadian, I oppose this policy, as I do not believe that people should be privileged because of creed, because of class, or because of color. I take my cues from the Canadian Charter of Rights. Israel has built a wall around Gaza and is presently on the verge of completing a wall around the West Bank so that they can control the movement of Palestinians. Being a human rights lawyer, I oppose this policy as I do not believe that the government of one state should be permitted to exercise control over the lives of people of another. I take my cues here from the UN Charter. There are many other policies that I would challenge on similar grounds. Does my opposition to these policies mean I am anti-Zionist, anti-Israel, anti-Semitic? Or does my opposition to these policies mean I am pro-equality, pro-fairness, and pro-human rights? Thank you.